it is great to be together with you in worship uh, as we gather to worship God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whether you are uh, gathered with us here in person or online via live stream, uh, welcome. In particular, if you're here for the first time, either visiting with us online via live stream or if you're visiting with us for the first time in person or first time back in a while uh, through the pandemic through these past couple of years, we want to welcome you. Uh, and there is there are welcome cards in the front uh, seat pocket in front of you. If you would fill out some information about yourself and leave it in the offering plate on your way out, we would love to follow up with you as uh, to see if there are ways that we can minister to and bless you as a church in the coming weeks. Uh, a few announcements as always this morning. Our partnership with WARM, the local mission, uh, is changing again this year because of the pandemic. If you're not familiar, WARM is a local mission that partners with churches like ours to host homeless families uh, for weekly rotations through the winter months. And uh, that has normally been the case. Last year, um, uh, COVID-19 caused us to support WARM in a different way. And again, this year, due to the high COVID-19 case rates locally, WARM has been suspended for 2022. Those families are still housed at Three Oaks. And we as a church, though we won't house uh, those families in for a week in February, we can still partner um, with WARM. And you can see in your announcement sheet that food and toilet items are needed and so we as a church have still committed to providing food and other necessary items for the week of February 20th through 27th. Now I know that feels like weeks away but as you know that'll be here before we know it. There is a spot on our website uh, where you can find how to sign up to contribute items to support those families during that week in February and beyond. Uh, one item that, did, that I myself forgot to get into the announcement sheet that you have in your bulletin this morning is that back in November, I hosted a sort of informal Q&A time after worship on a Sunday during Sunday school hour. And I would like to do that again on maybe a quarterly or so basis. Um, so the next one of those is going to be Sunday, February 6th at 11 o'clock uh, back here in the sanctuary. And I'll set it up so that you can be on live stream as well and hear uh, participate as well. So that's not in your bulletin, but two Sundays from now, February 6th, um, I will put more information out about what kind of topics we might talk about on that session and other times. But for now, if you'd like to have a little bit of that more informal conversation time with me after worship on a Sunday, that's coming two weeks from now on the 6th. Also, we're still in the habit of getting into the new year. If you are a member of our church and you um, typically receive giving envelopes from our finance ministry out on our table in the narthex, a, a few of those are still there with names on them. So if you're here in person, especially on your way out this morning, if you'd take a look, and if you haven't picked yours up yet, please do that this morning. There are a whole variety of other opportunities on ways to connect and serve in your announcement sheet and your bulletin. So I, as always, would encourage you to take a close look at that now and after worship. But the one of those we want to highlight in particular this morning, I want to invite one of our elders and leaders, Steve Carell, if he would come forward and tell us about an event coming next weekend called Belong. Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this Saturday, the January 29th, Congregational Life will be hosting our big event this year under the theme Belong. Uh, we'll be building bridges within our congregation through our own version of Family Feud. Now, Steve Harvey will not be in the house, but we have two entertaining co-hosts of our own, Kevin Miller and Jamie Rhodes. You, there you go. <laughs> You will be part of our new intergenerational family for the afternoon to experience fun competition and fellowship. Younger children will have their own activities led by local college students um, downstairs. Festivities will take place in the fellowship hall uh, from two to five. Sign up in person. Uh, you can see my wife in the back uh, after the service in the narthex, or you can do it online um, using the, the uh, church e-newsletter that was sent out uh, earlier this week. Um, let's see, where am I here? You, you can also order PAX t-shirts that so they've been up on the screen. Uh, um, they're pretty, $10, $15, and I think it's $30 for a sweatshirt hoodie. Um, they come in different uh, sizes and colors, uh, it's up to you, but then the long sleeve hoodie does benefit the youth group. 
Um, and again, that store will close on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, so make sure you order those shirts uh, sometime within the next few days. And the survey says, you belong. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. As we gather for worship, let's center our hearts on the Lord and his word with our memory verse for January, if you would join me in reciting our memory verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Let's quiet our hearts for worship. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship as we read responsively Psalm 19, verses 33 through 37. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I will find delight. Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Let us worship God. Sins they are. 
new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. You may be seated. Father, you hear us singing these words, and I hope, I pray that we are all here to take in what you have to give us, that we can focus on your word, that we can learn from it, and it can change us. Our hearts need to be changed. So I pray that we all have that soft heart for your word, Father, and we come away from here changed people. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join me in our affirmation of faith, faith as it is confessed in the larger catechism. How is the word of God to be read? The Holy Scriptures, Scriptures are, are to be read with a high and reverent esteem of them, with a firm persuasion that they are the very Word of God, and that He only can enable us to understand them, with a desire to know, believe, and obey the will of God revealed in them, with diligence and attention to the matter and scope of them, with meditation, meditation application, self-denial, and a prayer. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 5, verses 31 through 40, found on page 1055 in your pew Bible. 
Listen closely, for this is God's word for all of us. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept the human testimony, but I mention it to you that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work of the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me himself has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I want to welcome any of the children who are comfortable doing so to come forward for our time for young disciples as Mr. Mark Strayer has this morning's message for you all. So children, come on forward and you can sit here on the steps. loves me this I know everyone, boys and girls. I'm always so happy to see some of you up here uh, with us. So I'm going to start with a real easy question. What's this? Bible. Bible, yes. Now, does anybody know what that word Bible means? Probably not. It's from an old Greek word that means books. Well, wait a minute. I have a book in my hand. But its name is books. How can we figure that out? Yes? That's yeah, it is. But how can we, can, that, can we explain this? It's probably because there's books, there's not books inside it, but there's different pages that tell you different stories. Well, you're on the right track. Different pages that tell different stories, but how is this divided up? What's in, what's in this Bible? Books of the Bible, very good, yes, indeed. They're, now, the Bible is divided into two parts. Do you know what they are? Old Testament and New Testament. Very good, she said Old Testament and New Testament. Does anybody know how many books are in the Old Testament? Harder question. Anybody out here? 39 books in the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? 27. So there are 66 books in this book I'm holding in my hand. Now, what kind of books do you think we can find in here? Do you think I can find history books? Well, are you sure I can't find history? Well, you can. It's about a long time ago. Well, about a long time ago, yes. Very good. It was written a long time ago, but we can read the history of of so many things that God gave to his people, and can we read the history of how some people listened to God, and what happened when some people didn't listen to God? And we can read all the history of how Jesus came to this world, and he taught so many people, and he healed so many people, and he loved everyone, and he changed this world forever. How about um, law books? Can I find law books in here? 
Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Now I'm not going to find law. I'm not going to find United States tax laws. I, I'm not going to find Maryland traffic laws. But whose laws will I find in here? God's laws. And in fact, there's a there's a list of them that I know some of you have been learning about. What's that list called? Anybody? Very good, the Ten Commandments. Can I find them in here? Yeah, in fact, I can find them in more than one book in here. Do you think I can find um, love stories in here? <laughs> Are you sure I can't? Oh, yes, now you're nodding yes. In fact, you could say this whole Bible really is all about God's love for all of us. Can I find poetry in here? Think about it. Okay, I'm seeing some yeses and some noes. I can't. If some of the Psalms, for example, are beautifully written and they're very inspiring. They're written in such a poetic way. Um, can I find instruction books in here? No. Are you sure? No. Now I'm seeing some yeses. Uh, can I find instructions on how to fix my lawnmower? No. What, what kinds of instructions do you think I would find in here? God's instructions, right. So how we, can, how we can know right from wrong and instructions on how we should treat other people and lots of other things, but you're right, they're all, they're all God's instructions. Um, so th this is almost like a, a, a library that, that I'm holding in my hand with all these books in here. Now, do you know how long ago the Bible was written? I think it was 100 years ago. 500 years ago? Well, it was, now, it wasn't all written at the same time, but the New Testament, the newest books in the Bible, those books are all almost 2,000 years old. And there are books in the Old Testament that were written more than 3,000 years ago. Can you believe that? So when these books were written, it was a much different world than the world we live in today. Do you think they had cars back then? No? Computers? No. Cell phones? No. Internet? No. no? Wow. No social media. What a beautiful world that would be. <laughs> uh, did you want to say something? They don't have electricity. No, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have fast food restaurants. So, so when we, all these things that we have that they didn't. So when we read this Bible, we learn a lot about what their life was like way back then. And they certainly had problems then that we don't have today. No refrigerators, you're right. But, but a lot of the problems they had today are the very same problem they had back then are the very same problems we have today. It's knowing right from wrong and knowing how to obey God and knowing how to treat other people. Did you want to say something? Oh, no microwaves. No microwaves, you're right. So the truth and the wisdom and the directions that they found thousands of years ago, it's the same truth and the same wisdom and the same direction that we can find today. So we should all read our Bibles and try to understand them and try to follow what they tell us. Okay, so let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Dear God, you are so great. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all that you give us. Thank you for the Bible. Help us to read it and understand it and follow what it tells us. Amen. Okay, thank you all. There are just certain uh, children's messages where I think, well, now I don't need to preach in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. No, I appreciate, appreciate your te uh, teaching to the children. 
As we come to the Lord in prayer to pray for our community and our world, last Monday we as a nation observed Martin Luther King Day. Um, in my reflections that day and this week, I came across a prayer that he prayed at a Billy Graham event in 1957 not as long as 2,000 years ago, but 65 years ago, and yet the prayer rings just as true today with a few changes for our context. So let's join our hearts in prayer as led by the great leader and our brother in Christ, Martin Luther King Jr. Let's pray together. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, out of whose mind this great cosmic universe has been created, toward whom the weary and perplexed of all generations turn for consolation and direction. We, become, we come before your presence this morning, thanking you, God, for the many blessings of life. God, we come recognizing our dependence on you. We also come, O oh God, with an awareness, the fact that we have not always given our lives to that which is high and noble. In the midst of all of the high and noble aspects of justice, we, Lord, have followed injustice. Lord, we stand amid the forces of truth, and yet we deliberately lie. We stand amid the compelling urgency of the Lord of love exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ, and yet we live our lives so often in the dungeons of hate. For all of these sins, O oh God, forgive us. And in these days of emotional tension, Lord, when the problems of our world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, God, give us penetrating vision, broad understanding, power of endurance, and abiding faith, and save us from the paralysis of crippling fear. O oh God, we ask you to help us to work with a renewed vigor for a warless world and for a brotherhood that transcends race or color. We thank you, God, for this time together in worship and for the marvelous things you have done and continue to do in our county, city, and state. We ask you, O oh God, to continue blessing the work of every church and their pastors, elders, deacons, and members. T continue to bless every local missions organization and their leaders and participants. Lord, grant that all of us together across our county will look to you this morning and that our hearts and spirit will be opened to that divine inflow. Lord, we also pray for many in our own church family at PAX who are in need of your healing, your provision, your grace. And so we continue to pray this morning for Dave and Bev Porter, for Phil and Sue Menthe, for Bob and Deborah Rounds, for Ken and Jean Remy, for Larry Conrad, a shipmate of Grant Grussell's who has had his cancer return. Lord, for these and many more listed in our prayer concern sheet in the bulletin, you know each of their needs, and so we pray, uh, we intercede for them, that you would provide your grace and your sustaining power for them. Lord, all of these things we ask in the name of the mighty one, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue to worship God as our choir brings to the Lord their musical offering this morning.
Though we continue not to pass the offering plates in the sanctuary during worship during these COVID times, the, um, as we present to the Lord our tithes and offerings in prayer this morning, those offering plates are outside the sanctuary and there are giving options that you can easily find through our website. But let's pray together for this morning's tithes and offerings. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all your gifts to us, for the gift of music to encourage us. And Lord, as we give all of our gifts to you, we present them as a response to all that you have given us. Lord, we pray that through the gifts we offer to you, that you would order our steps, that you would set our priorities along the priorities of Jesus, and that you would use the offerings we present to you humbly in worship uh, for your glory and yours alone. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, would you stand and let's sing the doxology together. seated. <clears throat> well, as I was <clears throat> getting ready to leave the house early this morning, I had this bag in my hands to which Diana said, you have a lot of props today. <laughs> so you may be wondering what's in this bag here. I have a quiz for you this morning, just a little bit of a quiz. Help me identify some of these things. What is this? Yes, baseball bat, or to be more specific, a wiffle ball bat. What, what do you do with this? <laughs> hit the ball, that's right, hit the ball. Take the bat and hit the ball. Now apparently there are other uses for this or items like it, like, like as my kids are prone to do with items around the house. This is really good for whacking a sibling. <laughs> Don't tell my sister I said that. <clears throat> now let's see, what is this? A banana. A banana. What do you do with this? Eat it. Eat it. <laughs> Some, yes, yes, apparently other people know where I'm going with this already. You can also talk on it like a phone. Hello? <laughs> Hello? This works for my twins. I don't know why it doesn't work for me. They've been known to eat a banana and play with their banana phone at the same time. Now, how about, uh, you know, here's the obvious one. What's this? A bag. A bag. What do you usually do with this? carry stuff in it. Groceries, you see Olive Garden, you know where my family's been eating recently. Now as you know, young and old alike, you can also play with this like you can with cardboard. You can cut some holes in it, make a mask out of it. In my house this functions really well for cleaning up after our guinea pig every single week when we're changing the bedding. Now what's the point of this whole quiz? Now you can see there's an obvious uh, purpose for each of the things. Take a bat, and hit a ball, take a banana and eat it, and so forth. But apparently, there are some other uses for these items as well. So on that point, and I know Mark, Mark just quizzed the kids on it, which that's where I was going, uh, saying that I don't need to preach. He made a lot of the points that I'll try to reinforce with you all, which is good. Uh, what is this? And what do you do with it? Read it, yes. I mean, this is a book or books, as we just learned, some of us just learned. You take a book, and what do you do with a book? You read it. Although apparently, as we're starting this morning, we're going to start a new sermon series called Take This Book. And the premise of this series is that the Bible itself actually gives us a variety of instructions for how to use the Bible. For instance, if I handed this to you and I said, take this book, the obvious thing to do would be you would take it and you would start reading it. You know, you'd read it like another book. But in the coming weeks, we're going to say, take this book and, and we're going to fill in that blank differently each week. You can take this book and pray it. You can take this book and sing it. You can take this book and let it read you. I told one of my daughters where this series was going the other day, and she looked at me and said, huh? 
You can take this book and hide it. You can even take this book and eat it. That definitely got a huh out of my daughter. So what in, what in the world do all of these mean? We'll stick around the next few weeks and we'll find out together. But today, we begin with the natural and obvious uh, answer to that question. What do I do when I take this book? I read it. But not only that, I read it with the right glasses. Take this book and read it with the right glasses. Now, why do I say that? Because as Mark just shared with the children, this is the most, in some ways, the most unusual book in the world. There is no other book like it. It is technically not a book, as we just learned, but a library, a collection of books in one that span roughly 1,500 years of 40 or so authors, but they all still tell one unified story that points to Jesus. Now, in, on top of that being a strange feature of this thing we call the Bible, Many parts of the Bible itself, as some of you well know, are quite confusing and difficult to understand and strange. And so we need to take this book and read it with the right glasses. Now we can find some reassurance from the fact that certain people recorded in the Bible itself, they had trouble understanding scripture, the Bible. <clears throat> I mean, they didn't call it the Bible at the time, but the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament for the people of God in Jesus' time. And one example of that comes in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, where we're finding our second scripture reading today. We're in Luke 24, beginning at verse 13, in a passage that's often talked about as the road to Emmaus, or the walk to Emmaus, and you'll see why in a moment. This is basically an account of two disciples of Jesus uh, walking about seven miles three days after Jesus had been crucified. And they need help, in a sense, reading the scriptures with the right glasses. So listen closely, for this is God's word for all of us. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, we do give you thanks for your word, and we confess that we do not read it rightly on our own. So Holy Spirit, for myself, for every one of us here, we pray that you would open our eyes to see Jesus in a new and living way through this study of your word this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so here you have in Luke 24, two ordinary disciples who needed the resurrected Jesus to help, their, help them understand scripture and himself. If you think about it, you and I are just like those disciples. We need God's help to understand his scriptures and his message for us. In verse 27 of this reading, it says that in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to these two disciples what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. 
Now, many people, including myself, have often thought that this must have been the best Bible study ever. An overview of the entire Bible led by Jesus himself. I mean, I personally wish that Luke had recorded the rest of that conversation because surely it would give us a little bit more clarity about some parts of the Old Testament if we're getting the answers from the Lord himself. In fact, there was a German theologian hundreds of years ago named Johann Eck who said something similar. He said, oh Luke, why did you not describe for us Christ's reading of the scriptures, how he drew together the scriptures and which ones concerning himself with such knowledge we could better answer? But it pleased the divine majesty that in this way we must steep ourselves in scripture to understand it. Now in our first reading that Grant read from John chapter 5, there Jesus is talking with some religious leaders. I mean, these were the people who knew the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, better than anyone. And yet even to them, Jesus says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So here we have two disciples on one hand who are physically standing next to Jesus and yet they can't see scripture and Jesus for who, what they really are. And then in John 5 we had these religious experts, the, the experts of the day who don't see the scriptures in Jesus for who they really are. I mean why does God choose not to reveal himself a little more clearly at times, his truth throughout history? We believe that he has in certain ways, but as we know, there's certain mysteries to the faith and to this life. And that's where Johann X says, why? Because it pleased the divine majesty that we must steep ourselves in scripture to experience it. The metaphor there being like a tea bag steeping in boiling water. It has to steep for a while like we do in God's word. So God calls us to take this book and to read it, but not only that, but to read it with the right glasses. So what kind of glasses do we need to read scripture well? I have for you out of Luke 24 this morning, four steps for reading the Bible with the right glasses. And if you say four, that's a lot. Don't worry, most of these will go fairly quickly. To read the Bible well with the right glasses, we must first put down our faulty or wrong glasses, and then we must put on the glasses of the Holy Spirit, historical context, and Jesus Christ. We'll go through each of those in turn. First, in order to read the Bible with the right glasses, we must put down or take off our faulty glasses. In this story of the road to Emmaus, Jesus says to these two disciples, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's a strong rebuke to those disciples. How slow of heart and foolish? That's not very nice, Jesus. And yet he says it with a loving purpose. It wouldn't be that different from if I tried to read today's passage to you from this Bible while wearing the glasses I wore as a child, uh, which we have a picture of here. I hate to show this to you, but that's me with my heavy, oh yeah, don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, if I were wearing those glasses right now and tried to read this to you, you'd look at me and you'd say, Matt, take those off. Now you're not being rude, although they do look ugly, but your point is a helpful one. I can't see clearly. I need to take these wrong glasses off in order to read properly. And that's somewhat of what's going on with these disciples walking to Emmaus. So I don't have those glasses still, thank the Lord. <clears throat> so consider a different pair of glasses, 3D glasses. <clears throat> I hope I don't get dizzy doing this. If I do, choir, you, you're catching me, right? Yeah, okay. Now, I only get the full effect of my son's 3D Transformers book if I wear these while I'm wearing it, right? I mean, this is what this is, Transformers 3D. You want, do you want to read this right now? No, let's not, let's not. <laughs> but will these help me read the Bible more clearly? No? You don't think so? Okay. 
Yeah, you're right. When I look down at the Bible with these on, I see the Bible, but all I see is a bunch of red and blue, and maybe a little bit of purple. I haven't worn glasses like these in a long time. These are the wrong glasses. Now, as silly as this may sound, and as ridiculous as I may look, Satan has trained us, American Christians, to read our Bibles in red and blue. In red and blue. We see some verses about individual freedom or sexual purity or private property, and we say, ah, there's, there's the conservative Jesus. There's the red Jesus. And then we see other verses, like in the prophets, about systemic oppression and injustice, and we say, ah, there's the liberal Jesus. There's the, the blue Jesus. Now, some of us don't want to lose any of those verses of Scripture, and so we say, well, Jesus must have been purple then. The problem is, Jesus was not red, blue, or or purple, Scripture and Jesus proclaim many truths that align maybe with part of a human outlook on life here in America, but Jesus was not red, blue, or purple. And it's time that all of us, myself included, took those glasses off. And by step one, we confess to God the faulty glasses we read with. In other words, Lord, we read the Bible through our own filters and our biases, our own glasses. Lord, take off our faulty glasses and help us see you as you truly are, not just as we want to see you. So that's step one, confession. It's like those Emmaus disciples. We cry out, God, on our own, we don't see you clearly and correctly. Which brings us to second, step two. Second step, put on the glasses of the Holy Spirit, which I, I don't have a pair of here with me, if you can under, imagine. But if you think about it, where we stopped reading in Luke 24, we just read part of that story this morning, and these disciples still don't recognize Jesus, even after that Bible study. It's only later, when he eats and dines with them, as Luke says, that then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Step two, before reading any passage, short or long, is to pray this simple yet profound prayer. Holy Spirit, as I read this passage, open my eyes to see you clearly and correctly. And then trust that God will do that. So first, you've taken off the wrong glasses, and we have to do that again and again because we're human. But second, you've invited the Holy Spirit to put his glasses on you. And then step three, we put on the glasses of historical context, or simply context. Now there's a gentleman by the name of Greg Kokel, and Greg Kokel likes to say, never read a Bible verse. Never read a Bible verse. Now, wait a minute. Never read a Bible verse. This guy, Greg, must be a non-believer or an atheist or something. But no. Greg Kokel is a devoted disciple of Jesus and a Christian teacher. And yet still, he says, never read a Bible verse. Instead, always read a paragraph at least. Never read a Bible verse. Instead, always read a paragraph at least. Just give you one example of that principle this morning. Someone just recently was sharing with me uh, personally and pastorally, and they shared about how Jeremiah 29 verse 11 was a long source of hope and uh, comfort to them. And if you don't know that verse, Jeremiah 29 11 is a favorite verse of many disciples that says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I mean, many of you probably love that verse, and so do I. Some of us have it on coffee mugs or on wall hangings. It's so meaningful. But this person I was meeting with, this fellow disciple, was sharing that they'd recently been rereading the whole chapter of Jeremiah 29 not just verse 11. And in the very next verses, 12 and 13, God says through Jeremiah, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I mean, I'm the first to confess that on its own, verse 11 feels like a wonderful spiritual blank check, if you will. You know, Lord... 
I know you have a hope and a future for me. You'll fulfill my desires even if it takes a while. And yet there's so much more to it than that when you read the paragraph in Jeremiah. Seek me with all your heart. Oh, you mean I need to repent and pray that I have a part to play in receiving your grace too? And not only that, but this was written to Jewish people who were in exile for 70 years and God called them to flourish even in the midst of a persecuting culture. Hmm, maybe I should read that verse in its context. Maybe I need to not just read a verse, but at least read a paragraph, if not more. I have to put on the glasses of context. Now, we must also read the Bible with the glasses of context in the sense that, as I just alluded to with Jeremiah, these books were written in specific times and cultural settings. Again, one of the points that Mark shared with the children. And you all know examples of people who take something out of its historical context, and the Bible gets misapplied and abused all over the place. So to that end, I provided you with a handout in your bulletin today. I would encourage you to pull it out. You can't read it on the screen. It's just to show you what it looks like. It's called Resources to Strengthen Your Personal Reading of the Bible. I mean, we're all at different spots in our, how, you know, what we know or don't know about the Bible, and so there's a variety of tools here. And I own most, not all of these books. If you'd like to borrow a copy of one of these after worship, I would love to loan them out to anyone and everyone. So you can look at that later, but I know, I know many people who would say, I'm not much of a reader. You know, I'm not much of a reader. Enough with all the books. So... For readers and non-readers alike, if you have your phone with you, I would like to, you to pull it out now. It's okay. Yes, the pastor told you you can pull out your phone during worship. Now, if you don't have your phone with you this morning, uh, good for you. You're better than me. <laughs> you left it at home to focus on God. But if you do have it out, go to your app store. We're going to do this real time for those of you who are here. And this is what it looks like on an iPhone. Go to your app store and search for Bible Project. Bible Project. See how fast you can type. Bible Project. And then mine, if you go to the next slide, mine says open because I downloaded it already, but you can click download. It's free. Don't worry. I'm not making you pay anything to Apple or Samsung. Download. Now, once you've clicked and it seems to have taken, which may take a minute with your data or your Wi-Fi, click the download button on Bible Project, and then you can close your phone, let it download, and put it away for later. But while it's downloading, I'll just say to you that next time, next time you are reading a Bible passage personally in a small group or anything, and you're thinking to yourself, Pastor Matt said that I should know the context of this verse or this passage before I dive deep into it. If you don't have a clue where to start, which for many years I didn't either, then the Bible Project is a simple, easy place to go. They have these great short, short is the key here, but are artistically compelling and theologically deep introductions to almost all the books of the Bible. So let's say you're in the book of John and you don't know anything about John. I just need some context. You can find a video they've done that just gives you the lay of the land. It's just a simple, great resource. I mean, I use those videos and their other stuff in my own personal Bible reading because they help me get that original context, even some application for my life, and they help me find Jesus even in those obscure parts of the Bible. Which brings us to the final point this morning, step four to reading with the right glasses. To read the Bible with the right glasses, we must also put on glasses that are able to look for Jesus himself. In Luke 24, again, Jesus says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to him everything concerning himself. And then John 5, he told those religious experts, these are the scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. All parts of scripture, even the difficult and obscure ones, somehow, somehow point to Jesus. However, a common problem with that is that many of us, Christian and non-Christian, many people will say, oh good, Jesus is the most important part. That's good because I like Jesus, but I don't really like those other parts of the Bible very much, so I'll stick with him. 
But did you know that without the Old Testament, Jesus literally makes no sense? Trying to follow and understand Jesus without some study of the Old Testament is a lot like if you know nothing about Star Wars and someone tells you that Darth Vader is actually Luke's father. If you don't know anything about Star Wars, that statement is meaningless. You need the bigger story. Now, for maybe the younger Harry Potter fans out there, it's to truly understand and follow Jesus without some understanding of the Old Testament is like not knowing anything about Harry Potter and someone tells you the truth about Professor Snape. To which some of you are thinking that statement is meaningless to me. I mean, we try to make sense of Jesus without the Old Testament, and yet we can't have one without the other. Now, I get it. I prefer to stick with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because I can understand what Jesus is saying. Leviticus, I don't understand. But that's why tools like the ones I'm giving you today are helpful to get that context. Because without it, the amazing grace of Jesus literally makes no sense. Now, last week, Pastor Lloyd Larson, guest preaching with us, he said that true worship costs us something. True worship costs us something, and the same is true of reading the Bible well. I'm first to admit to going through seasons where reading the Bible personally and consistently is non-existent. I mean, it's hard to keep that habit. It costs us something. But maybe you're familiar that statistically speaking, the average American watches at le or about five hours of television per day. Five hours per day. And yet 15 minutes of reading the Bible daily, even if you don't quite know where you are and what that passage is about, you can still, by God's grace, get something small and life-changing out of it. That is only 5% of our TV and entertainment time. So yes, reading the Bible well is costly, but it really doesn't have to cost us that much. In fact, now that I've done that experiment with, with you, next time you grab your phone like I do, and you're going to mindlessly scroll through social media or play Wordle or whatever the case may be, maybe you just, oh, oops, goodness. Maybe you don't drop your iPad. <clears throat> Maybe you uh, scroll through the Bible Project app instead and just see what God teaches you, some little fact that you wouldn't have gotten if you were sitting there on Instagram or on Facebook or on Wordle. Bible reading costs us something, but the Bible points us to Jesus who paid the ultimate cost, as we sang earlier, who paid an ultimate eternal cost on our behalf. If he paid it all with his very life, how can we not give him that little bit of taking up our Bibles and reading them with the right glasses? The Son alone provides us life, but we meet him in the scriptures. So let's meet him there together. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we do thank you as we say week to week, thanks be to God for your word for that's the only way we know 2,000 years later about the grace and the amazing power of your son, Jesus. But Lord, myself, for all of us here, we have our daily habits, we have our ways of thinking, and yet, Lord, even in those good habits, you are always calling us to deeper trust, deeper obedience in you by seeing you alive and well in your scriptures. So, Lord, I pray for myself, for every one of us, whatever that small next step might be to read your word and to see Jesus and experience your spirit in a living way, whatever that small next step practically for each of us is to do that, Lord, I pray that you'd guide us and direct us so that we might receive the Son who gives us eternal life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, would you stand and let's sing together one more time. Thank you.
before we leave here, if, if you're comfortable doing so, I hope that you'll join us in our fellowship hall down here for coffee hour and then for Sunday school following that. And if you, this morning or any Sunday, need prayer for anything in particular and you want some prayer in confidence, we have a prayer room set up in our offices back this way. If you follow the signs, you can find someone there ready to listen and to pray with you. But now as we go from this place, receive this benediction, this good word from the Lord. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And may the blessings of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen.